Okay, so I'm here in Mordor. I'm simply walking. Everyone say hi to Mount Doom. Hi. And I have a topic today which is rather controversial. It's a theory that I find fascinating. I find the discussion around it very fascinating. It has a lot of aspects I really like and then also a lot of problems too. So here's the theory. This guy and this guy. Tell me if you hear where I'm going with this. A power is rising in the east and all the kingdoms of men are falling to it. The west is being invaded by endless hordes of deadly warriors, this army that just suddenly exists, no one has ever heard of them before, all under the control of a, from our perspective, mysterious shadowy warlord. And one by one, the kings of the west are falling to this tyrant. He's enslaved them basically, made tribute kingdoms out of them. And these hordes are moving further and further to what the west considers the heart of civilization. You have armies of other eastern lands, other southern lands joining the cause against the west. So for a western perspective, this invasion is an existential threat to the entire civilized world, to the entire world of men. And here's the controversial part. These warriors, from the point of view of your average Western man standing in their way, being from a different race, having a radically different appearance, these men legitimately look like monsters to the Europeans. That is the fact of how anyone saw anyone different from them throughout all of human history until like a hundred years ago. If you're different from me, then you're a monster. You know, you imagine your average Bulgarian dude, your average Pole, your average Russian. This guy's never seen anyone who doesn't look pretty much like him. Now you have these warriors who are violent on a level that no one has even heard of before. They are pillaging everyone, they're killing everyone, they're raping everyone. This is pure terror and it's intentional terror. That's why they do things like catapulting dead bodies of victims into the cities that they're attacking. From the victim's perspective, of the whole thing was beyond barbaric. It was beastly, maybe even demonic to these people. And the way the hordesmen acted, the way they lived, seemed equally beast-like to their victims. Mongol soldiers ate raw meat. They sometimes drank the living blood of their horses to keep hydrated. They didn't bathe at all, so they were absolutely filthy. And washing clothes was a taboo to them, so these hordesmen just wore their clothes until they rotted off their bodies. So take that and combine it with completely different facial structures from anything these Europeans had ever seen. Combine it with a language that, to Western ears, sounded like a bunch of barking, snarling grunts. Combine this also with the pointlessness of all this to the west, there just seemed no purpose whatsoever in all this destruction. These hordes would just keep moving across the continent, laying waste to every city, endlessly killing, endlessly raping, pillaging, until the whole world fell to this great evil warlord. And that is how it seemed, until one day all of it just stopped. It was suddenly over, there was a great retreat. This entire endless army of these demonic killers just disappeared. They just rode back to their homeland with seemingly no reason at all. And only later will we learn it was because their leader, the Great Khan, had died. Okay now, so how would such an event embed itself into a culture? Hundreds and hundreds of years later, how would its motifs creep into the stories people told? And you know, we're dealing here with a collective trauma of millions and millions of victims. Accuracy is not going to be the point here. History is going to be carried down through its own channels, and history will know that these Mongol warriors were just humans like you and me. But when a mother is telling her child a bedtime story, she's going to open her mouth, and what's going to come out? Well, what awakened fear in this person? What in their life scared them the most? What form will the scariness take? What sort of horrific imagery will the story's evil model itself after? And how is the story going to play out? What will salvation look like when it comes in the end? And here we have to wonder what the Western mind even thought had happened at the end of all this. It was not a military victory. It seemed almost like magic. And yeah, perhaps they had heard that magic was involved in all this. Perhaps they heard whisperings of a golden trinket this dark warlord possessed that granted him divine powers. So this process I'm kind of roughly and dramatically describing is included in the overall category of mythologizing, which is how Tolkien viewed his works and invented the mythology of England. And mythologies are not like normal stories. They're drawing on completely different sources. It's not the creativity of a solitary author shaping all the events of a narrative to entertain. No, with a myth, the story coalesces from ideas, information, memories, values, cultural content that is already there in the culture. And that cultural content expresses itself almost like a volitional force through the storytellers. The storytellers of these types of myths are shaping arcs, shaping themes, shaping archetypes, but they're not choosing these archetypes. The archetypes are there as the most resonant archetypes to that culture already. A great example of this myth-like story in modern times is Godzilla which is a story that captured for Japanese people all these feelings and memories and ideas and traumas related to nuclear weapons. The storyteller shaped that cultural content, provided specific imagery, but gigantic, destructive, uncontrollable force laying waste to cities, the storyteller did not choose that. That was there. And all that just flowed through the storyteller to express itself in this particular form. So Tolkien and probably countless other storytellers throughout Western history take the Mongol invasion, this event, this memory, this trauma, and these storytellers, Tolkien included, give shape, provide specific imagery to its set of archetypes. And these archetypes, by the way, which represent, I think, by far the most resonant depiction of evil for the Western mind. Existential fear of invading hordes, monstrous barbarians conquering the world, an unseen dark master of it all, 
controlling it from his mysterious realm that lies in the direction of mystery. It's not the West. The West is just water. We know what's West, just water, and then India, obviously. But East, no one knows what's there. Total mystery, it's a question mark. It's where our nightmares would spawn from. But then once we do know what's there, once we do know what's East, well, then we enter a new brief era where a new cardinal direction gains resonance, which we sometimes do see. Now the North is the mysterious direction. The North is where we'll see our existential threat to civilization, mindless hordes controlled by a single leader who are defeated instantaneously once we kill said leader. And then once we've explored that, once the North is no longer mysterious, well, now there's a very obvious new mysterious direction, the final mysterious serious direction one might say. Aliens and their tropes follow the same pattern. They are invading the world, destroying civilization. They possess technology, which is deadly on a different level. We've got the hive mind tropes, and even more blatant, we have the leader, the mothership. Take out the mothership, alien invasion over instantly. So what I'm saying, bottom line, is that this event that traumatized these two continents birthed a new archetype for evil in our stories. What it is, how it works, what it looks like, what it sounds like, its goals, the type of threat it poses, and what human victory against it looks like. This is a trope grouping that we just see again and again in different forms, and on its surface, it doesn't make a ton of sense why these characteristics would be compelling. Why are aliens depicted as kind of filthy? Why is their skin a different color? Why are they beast-like? Why are they typically coming to destroy all of modern civilization? And why does so many of them have a mothership that just instantly knocks out all the underlings once it's gone? How does that even make sense? That's not realistic. I'm not buying that because that doesn't happen, except for that one time that that mysterious army invaded the world with advanced technology and different skin color and general filthiness, and then when their leader died, they vanished. Yeah, that one time, all of this kind of sort of did happen. So I think it makes sense that this type of event would take this type of place in our storytelling. Now, there are a lot of really strong questions on this theory from the standpoint of history, and those are worth its own discussion. But the controversy, when I'm talking about the storytellers giving specific imagery to archetypes, Tolkien did give us this specific imagery. And he also gave us this specific description of that imagery. The idea of Tolkien basing his race of monsters off of Asians, that idea sounds kind of racist to us. I'm part Asian myself, not Mongolian, but I have a different face structure and different skin tone and slanty eyes. This is kind of relevant to me. How do I feel about all this? And before I give my opinion, please comment your opinions as well. I definitely want to know what you think about this theory overall, but also this criticism of it. So on the one hand, just as far as what I've seen, I've seen people go so far as to criticize anyone who even brings this theory up. Anyone who even asks about the theory is problematic and racist. And then on the other hand, I've read about phenomena like Mongolian people themselves nowadays in modern times using orc as a slur for each other to mean like a lowlife and uncivilized country bumpkin. We might say a redneck. It seems like they adopted this word based on Tolkien mythology and noting a lot of the things I mentioned in this video about that historical period, a lot of the parallels. Personally, I've tried to give it thought with as balanced of a head as my shoulders can handle. And the more I think about it, the more I just don't really see the problem. This is not about Mongolia. It's not about Mongolians. It's about Chinggis Khan and his army in the 1200s. And to be absolutely clear here, Mongolians, wonderful people. 12th century Mongol hordes, Chinggis Khan, evil. <laughs> Murdering, raping, pillaging. It's hard to imagine a legitimate problem someone could raise with calling these specific people monsters. And also, I lied, it's not even about Chinggis Khan and his army. It's about what a medieval culture's hypothetical mythologizing of that trauma might look like. Same way that people of the Americas might mythologize European conquering hordes into monsters, or Africans might mythologize the conquering hordes of colonists they faced, or the slavers they faced. The point is we are really removed from actual people here. The theories are saying basically these are the nightmares that this historical event has caused us. This is how a specific grouping of a specific people at a specific time were internalized by my great-great-grandpa's unconscious, which he had no control over and probably no awareness of whatsoever. That is the unpart of unconscious. To bring this back to the actual, like, race of Asian people and say Tolkien was dehumanizing them, when we are historically removed and also just, like, realistically removed, we're not in the realm of reality, we're in the realm of people's minds here. I just don't see it. Like I characterized it earlier, I think his goal was to be a medium for this cultural story and these cultural archetypes that were already embedded in Western culture to express themselves. He was seeking the imagery that was most resonant to that, he was painting a picture of realistically troubling, realistically mythologized ancient drama. And that's something that's so distant from any roots where it came from once upon a time long ago, so distant that we don't see it at all anymore, that connection is not recognizable. Someone has to talk about it, explain it, for people to realize that there even was a link to something real in the first place at all. The mythologized version of these ideas, memories, etc., it's taken on a life of its own. It's something totally new at this point. And I would go further, I think that's actually the most interesting part of all of this, which is how myths paint this fascinating picture of this weird interaction between history and imagination. We can compare the mythologized version to reality and see how radically inaccurate this mythologizing process can be. Because Chinggis Khan was a real person, and Mongolia is a real place, and Mongolian people are real, and the reality is nothing like the mythologized version. 
And I'm already doing the version of this visiting Middle Earth meme by going to New Zealand. I'm not gonna like go to Mongolia just for this video. No, just kidding, welcome to Mongolia. So the thing I think is most interesting is the category that they got completely wrong. And this is something that I call filling in the blanks. Because there's part of this whole mythology thing that they get not right exactly, but at least it's anchored somewhere. It's a translation of events. We turn brave men into heroes, we turn cruel men into monsters. It's stuff that did happen, it just transformed by this cultural processing of history and trauma into stories. The other part of this, the wildly inaccurate stuff, what I think is going on there is that you have all these questions that kind of need to be answered in order to just tell the story. You have all these holes that result from the limited perspective of the people in question, where they just didn't know what happened, they had no answers. And then you have the, the imagination, the mythologizing mind coming in and filling in all these blanks. Something like, and I don't know where this one actually came from, but it's like the stork bringing babies. So you gotta imagine that there were just some kid who didn't know where babies come from, and his imagination just came up with something, it just filled in that blank for him. And Tolkien does an excellent job of capturing this filling in the blanks form of inaccuracy. What do we know? Well, we know the level of threat these invading armies pose to us, we know their cruelty, we know their tactics, we know they're firmly loyal to a single leader, and that's about it. That's stuff we capture and we translate, but then what don't we know? Well, we don't know where they came from, we don't know what that place is like, we don't know what the people are like there, we don't know almost anything about this great warlord, we don't know what he looks like, we don't know his motives, we don't even really know the totality of what he's doing, we just know the part that involves us. But we fill in the blanks with ideas that seem logical to us. If these people are all about destroying all that is good as we know it, they must come from a land that is itself a harsh, desolate place of darkness and fire and torture and death. We don't know what the normal non-military people are like, so there must just be none of them. There's no farmers, there's no herders, it's just all fortresses full of soldiers marching. And we don't know anything about this warlord, about about this warlord, <laughs> but surely no human could inflict this much damage on the world. Especially considering the fact that our supreme western military might comes from the fact that we're the strongest and we have the best culture, and everyone else in the world is this primitive barbarian. So this guy, this guy must be something altogether different. Altogether inhuman, it must be some kind of incarnation of evil itself. So that's one major blank that was filled in, identity. We just didn't know who this person was. Our imaginations filled in the blanks, and that became the most resonant archetype for us, more resonant than the reality. Motive was another blank, another big one. The West could not know Chinggis Khan's motives, they couldn't understand how he saw what he was doing, and neither can we, but this one is interesting for a different reason than our first example. On the one hand, no Dark Lord in history was actually like after creating a world of gloom and doom and sadness and destruction and death and sadness. No human being is actually like that. But then on the other hand, he obviously was trying to destroy things. I mean, he, he, he was trying to destroy all these kingdoms, all these nations. But then on the third hand, we have the other narrative, one you don't hear much outside of Mongolia. And I'm not passing judgment here. I think these things are worthy to highlight. But Mongolians see a lot of good in what Chinggis Khan did. Here's a quote from one of my tour guides that I had last time I was here. He said, I have a lot of respect for this guy because of how much he cared for education and equality. Which is not something you associate with Chinggis Khan in the West. But it is true that Chinggis Khan eradicated all these class systems in all the places that he conquered, and he only cared about ability. He, he established what was essentially a meritocracy. If you had skills, if you had education, if you were an artist, you know, if you could write, if you could read, those were the things that placed you ahead in society. It was not your noble heritage. It was not blood. He got rid of all those things. He only cared about ability. And this idea of making this empire where you have people get ahead based on their skills, you know, that was something which was wildly ahead of its time. It was a real reset button on civilization, did away with a lot of these oppressive systems of hierarchy and nobility and aristocracy. And yeah, he was at the top. He definitely was a tyrant. Establishing a meritocracy in place of this feudal system, the West was stuck in that feudal system for centuries after this. And you know, something else I just learned coming here. This is Karakorin, this is the ancient capital. Well, actually, the ancient capital is all of this. It was one of the biggest cities at the time. Uh, and it was an incredibly diverse city because he didn't really, he didn't really care about like eradicating religions. And he 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 had all the religions in his capital. He had Christians, he had Muslims, he had the Mongolian shamans, he had uh, Buddhists. So there is something to be said for establishing this kind of society, this multicultural, diverse society that was accepting of all these different kinds of creeds. To establish that in the 13th century, that is something worth highlighting. And it doesn't get rid of all the bad that he did, you know. But it it makes it makes the reality complex. It makes the history complex, and it reveals a lot to push the myth to try to capture that complexity. You imagine well into the fourth or even fifth ages of Middle Earth, and you have this indigenous Mordorian population living in the now modern country of Mordor. And you as a Western tourist, you want to visit this place. It has so much history, it seems like there's a lot to learn from it. So you buy a plane ticket and you fly into Sauron International Airport, and you meet up with your tour guide and he takes you to the big statue of Sauron that they have, standing heroically. And you can go to museums, you can learn about the history of the military campaigns, you, know, you can see artifacts from the time, maybe they have a replica of the ring, maybe they have an actual crucible he was said to have used. 
and you hear the more Dorian narrative of events, that the world of men was dominated by these corrupt rulers, which was true, and this broken feudal system probably also true in Middle-earth, I don't know if they had a feudal system. And the only alternatives were these isolationist peoples who only cared for themselves, didn't care at all about the common man or the common orc, and Mordor sought to liberate the world from this tyranny. Sauron wanted to use their tyrannical magic against them to turn them into vassal rulers of a great king who would destroy all these broken systems of the second and third age. And I'm not saying I agree, I firmly disavow the political views of Sauron, but it's the complexity that the mythologizing instinct has no real way of capturing. Mythology will fill in the blanks based on resonance to our perspective. They were trying to kill me, well destruction must define them. Desolation and darkness is what they inflict on me, well that must be their comfort zone. They must have a mountain in their land literally called Mount Doom, they probably love names like that. And then what's the reality? Well the reality is the most destructive force in human history, these monstrous hordes of killers and rapists, you know, who wanted to pillage the entire world for their great con, they came from a land that's really beautiful. You know, it's not black and burnt parts of it are really green. You know, it's not full of life exactly, but you get some life over here. But it's certainly not full of death either. And there's just lots of people, there's just a lot of normal people, just herders and farmers, and they're just regular. They're really nice, they're really welcoming to strangers. And you know, they kind of have to be because it's it's not harsh in the way that we painted it in our, in our imagination, but it is a very harsh place to live, so people have to be kind to each other, people have to be welcoming to each other. You know, one of the most interesting things about this place is just that it's so empty. You know, there's just, oh. You know, one of the most shocking things about this place is just that it's just how empty it is. You know, it's, it's so sparsely populated. And, you know, imagine imagine if the Fellowship got to Mordor, and it was just this beautiful grassland that was mostly empty, had a few goats, and like, that was it. And, and you know, you know, had just a couple farmers. You know, imagine if that was Mordor. I wanted to make this video, and I wanted to make it like this. Because we tell ourselves a lot of stories about what the world is like, but we don't actually connect it to the world. Ask any weeb about their actual trip to Japan, the time they spend there experiencing actual life there. Or ask any K-pop fan the same about Korea and Korean life. Better yet, ask about their third or fourth trips. Or take anyone who watches the news in the US, take them to a Middle Eastern country. I'm Jewish, take a Jew to a Muslim country. Or take literally anyone not from Africa to Africa, and we see this mythologizing process in full already going on all around us, permeating us, taking place inside our own heads without us even realizing it. I think it's fascinating to let daylight into these narratives, talk about them openly, and challenge them by supposing these stories were history. It's taking this extremely meaningful activity we do, telling stories, and really taking it at its word, in its own terms, pushing it until we reach the boundaries where it starts to crack, show inaccuracies, absurdities, or until it reveals completely opposite perspectives are from what it's supposed to. These beautifully rich and beautifully human contradictions. If you've seen other videos of mine, you may notice that I have an affinity for types of stories and characters and themes and scenes that act as a mirror of human imperfection and just highlight that. Just leave it for us to make our own conclusions. It's these flawed parts of ourselves that really reach like deep into me, like deep into my spleen and grab it and squeeze it. Like, look at this passionately messy set of human actions. Look at this earnest but truly bizarre inaction accurate, fearful, prideful, prejudice, hopeful, terrible, wonderful, dreamlike picture painted by a thousand brains over the course of a thousand years of a real event that happened, of something that a different cultural institution in history preserved and has rediscovered accurately. Look at them side by side. Let's sit in the messiness of the differences and feel the humanity that lives and breathes in the gap between the horribly true and the horribly imagined. I love that. I love learning history. I love psychology. Obviously, I love storytelling. But the points of intersection and clashing is like my favorite thing ever. So, a lot of delicate topics covered in this video. I hope I didn't stumble over myself too much in framing them according to my intentions, which I'm going to take this opportunity to make crystal clear. Number one, I'm making a video about this theory because I think it is a fascinating theory. There are a lot of very strong questions on this theory. I'm going to leave a pinned comment talking about my biggest problems with it. Number two, I don't think the theory is racist and I don't think Tolkien was racist. I can 100% sympathize with people who feel this way. It is an uncomfortable aspect of this world building when you shine a light on it. But it's also just not what it looks like like. The mythologizing itself is its own fact of history. The dehumanization is factually how the victims seem to process their trauma. It's just what we see across all these examples I mentioned. And it was never about race, it was about specific people, evil people, who got the demonic terrifying depiction they themselves probably would have wanted and the demonic depiction they deserved. And either way, it's become something totally new at this point. It's taken on a life of its own. Even if these same building blocks could be absolutely racist in a different context. Three, I am going to address myself to any Mongolians 
who's listening here, I think Chinggis Khan was an evil tyrant. It's hard for any Westerner to see him any other way besides that. But that said, I think the way many Mongolians highlight the good that he did is really interesting, and it creates a complex picture. Those facts are more than worth bringing into any discussion about Chinggis Khan, even if we disagree on the ultimate conclusion. And obviously, I respect opinions that are different than mine. I respect any Mongolian who has that positive perspective. Hearing that perspective has definitely changed a lot about how I view this historical event, even if it doesn't change the moral judgment I place on this guy at the end of the day. For, if you could not tell, I absolutely love Mongolia. I've been to a lot of places. Mongolia is one that I recommend every chance I get. It is so unique. I love the spirit of the people I meet here. I love the culture. I love the history. I love the nature. And I have a ton of respect for the people for the kinds of challenges they've faced and continue to face. The whole point of bringing the video to Mongolia was to show the contrast, to show how beautiful and vibrant and wonderful the reality is compared to what the traumatized Western imagination twisted it to be centuries down the line. So I sincerely hope that came through. I do expect any Mongolians watching will dislike my treatment of their history while hopefully still being understanding of it, but I hope they're happy with what I was able to show of their amazing country. Five, lastly, something I did not discuss at all, but I can already hear the commenters click clacking away, typing angry comments. This is not allegory. I don't think that discussion will be of interest to everyone here, so I'm going to give an explanation of my take on this in that pinned comment I mentioned earlier with the other challenges to the theory. And that's it. Obviously, this was a very fun video to make. Hope you all enjoyed. Shoutouts to the patrons, support the channel on there if you wish. This video is part of a series I'm going around talking about all my kooky wacky theories about Lord of the Rings and locations relevant to the story. Next week we're going to be back in New Zealand, but different type of place from these last two videos. And there's going to be a malformed little surprise midweek this week as well. Subscribe to follow along this analytical journey through Middle Earth, and thanks for watching.